Hello everybody, I'm Ben Mowry with the Games Group here at Autodesk, and today we're going to see how to add a custom grayscale screen space effect to the Stingray renderer. Here we will only focus on the steps to add the screen space effect, however we do have a PowerPoint deck that goes into more detail on the renderer. Stingray's renderer is entirely data driven, meaning that new effects which would have previously required C++ coding are now possible with only changes to our renderer configuration files. The main configuration file we're interested in is referenced by our project's settings.ini file. So let's take a look at that. We're working on the vehicle project and in the root directory of our project folder we have settings.ini. So let's open that up in Visual Studio or your favorite text editor. So the settings.ini file has a whole lot of other content besides just the renderer. For example, we point at what packages to load on boot. But what we're interested in for now is the renderer settings. Notice that all of these are commented out. We're not actually overriding any of the default settings exposed by the renderer. The renderer is defined by the render config variable, which points at core Stingray renderer renderer. So if we move to our Stingray directory and we go to the Stingray renderer folder, we have renderer.render config. So let's open that up in Visual Studio and take a look. So here we have the renderer settings, the default values that we just saw referenced in settings.ini. Another key section of this file is the shader libraries. This is an array of references to shader program files. Uh, for example, we have lighting. This is a library of shader programs related to lighting. We also have post-processing, which is what we're looking at today. Next up we have our global resources. This is where the frame buffers are defined. We have our depth buffer, we have G buffers, we can define the format of each buffer all through the settings in the config file. So if we wanted to try a floating point buffer instead of 8-bit uh, uh, integers, no problem. Just change the, the settings file. Very easy stuff to do. After the buffers, and we have a lot of buffers, we go to the layer configs section. And this is essentially a set of step-by-step -step instructions for how to render a given frame. So if we think about a traditional code-based engine, we'll have a render function. The main rendering function will first uh, clear our render targets. We do that with this instruction. It would then do the G-buffer rendering. It'll populate the G-buffers by going through all the geometry in the scene. We have another step here for lighting. Just step by step, just like you would with code. And then when we have an operation that's too complex and grows beyond what we can easily fit in our layer configuration, we have resource generators. Resource generators are essentially subroutines. They're step-by-step -step sequences of instructions, otherwise known as modifiers. And when we can't fit them into a layer, it just becomes too cumbersome, just as we would with a C program when we move code out into a function. Here we'll move rendering instructions or modifiers into resource generators. So we have a resource generator for shadow mapping, platform specific one. Uh, Xbox One has a feature called ESRAM. But we work our way down. Eventually we will find the resource generator we're interested in, which is post-processing. We're adding our own custom grayscale uh, gray screen space effect. So we'll look at the list of modifiers here for various post-processing effects. We've got Bloom, Scene Combine, and we're just going to keep going to the very bottom and insert a new modifier of our own here. This is some code I prepared, just cut and paste it in. And what we have here is two instructions or modifiers. The first one is using the default copy shader provided with Stingray. 
does nothing more than copies the output, which is the current rendering result after all of the other screen space effects have been applied to a scratch buffer, which we will define in a moment. The next instruction runs our post FX demo on uh, our, our demo shader on that buffer to regenerate the output target. Notice that the type of both of these is full screen pass and all that means is that we run a shader program on a full screen quad to iterate over every pixel. So these aren't 3D operations, these are 2D operations that happen at the frame buffer level. So now let's go and define that buffer. We'll go back up to our global resources section. This is where all of our buffer definitions are. These buffers are not in any particular order, so we'll just insert ours right here. So here we give it a name, post FX demo scratch. That's the same string that we referenced below. It's a rendered target, like most other buffers in this section. It's going to be exactly the same size as the screen and it's going to be in the RGBA8 format. So now that this is in place, the last thing we need to do is to define our grayscale shader program. We can put that in any of our shader source library files. We'll navigate over here to shader libraries. Post-processing would be a good place to put it, but because we're just doing a quick test, I'm going to put it in development. So we'll open up the development.shader source file. Try that one more time. There we go. And here we have a big list of shaders. And we're going to pick one of them to use as a template. So here we have the filter cube map shader. It's kind of similar to what we want to do. So we'll cut and paste it and edit it to make our own, which I will cut and paste right in here. So here we have the post FX demo shader. We declare the samplers. And this is all pretty much boilerplate stuff we copied from another shader except for this line which adds up our red green and blue values for each pixel divides by three to average it and then sets that scalar result to each of the red green and blue components making it grayscale. Now there are a lot of great resources out there on the internet about coding shader programs so we're not going to go into any more detail about shader coding than this. Uh, we just copy a template from one of the other shader programs in the file and add our own code and you're good to go. But there is one more thing we need to do which is to declare the shader in another block. So again following the filter cube map template we have a block here which defines the filter cube map shader and we'll cut and paste in a slightly customized version. All we did here was change the name of the shader. Not really a whole lot else going on. There is one last thing we need to do which is to add a static compile directive. We need to tell Stingray when it boots up to take the code that we've just provided and compile it into a binary shader representation that the graphics card can run. So here we have our copy shader. It has a whole bunch of different arguments. It's a very versatile pro, uh, shader program. It can uh, flip the image it's copying along the, uh, the vertical axis. It can do other conversions. And here we specify which combinations of arguments that we may see at runtime. And we pre-compile different flavors of the copy shader program for those arguments. Now our post FX demo is much simpler than that. There are no arguments. So this one line here will do. We simply make Stingray aware, Stingray aware that there is this shader and that it should be compiled. So with that, we're ready to run the game. We'll hit play here. And now we have the exact same demo we had before, but now it's running in grayscale. just like an old black and white movie. 
And what's more is, without reloading the editor, these changes carry over to our editor viewport. So as you add new rendering effects, you can preview the results in real time without recompiling the engine, without modifying any C++ code. So that's how you add a basic screen space effect using Stingray's data-driven renderer. Any questions or suggestions for future videos, please post to the Stingray forum.